This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Even before the pandemic, half of all adults reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. That's according to a report from the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murphy. In 2023, that report, called Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation, talked about the physical consequences of loneliness, increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and dementia. The key is to remember there are individual steps that we can take in our own lives today that will make a difference. Just spending 15 minutes a day with people we care about, making sure that we're fully present when we're interacting with others and we're not distracted by technology, looking for ways to help other people and neighbors and coworkers recognizing that small acts of service can be powerful in making us feel more connected with one another. These are the small steps that can make a big difference in how connected we feel. Murthy stressed how social connection is the key to individual and community health and well-being. And this idea of social connection is something that today's guest has spent a lot of time focused on. Deb Bibbins is the founder and CEO for All Ages, an organization uniting older adults and younger generations, and its statewide initiative, the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. Deb and I sat down earlier this month at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven. The theme of the weekend was How We Live. Today, we'll listen back to our conversation. I started by asking Deb about how she became interested in the topic of loneliness. I am not a clinical psychologist. I am not a social scientist. I am someone who spent nearly 30 years in the property casualty insurance industry, retired from that industry about a decade ago, and started giving back to the community in a variety of ways, and watched a family member go through a really difficult period of time before he passed away. Um, dealing with loneliness, and um, started doing some research on my own. Well, what is this? What's happening here? Um, and, and lo and behold, it's been a problem for decades. It's been growing as a problem. And I thought, okay, I need to find a nonprofit in the state of Connecticut that's focused on this issue, and I couldn't find one. And so decided to launch For All Ages. So I just want to lay the groundwork with that, that. And I think it's important to understand that I am just like all of you, right? I'm, I'm someone that simply cares about community, simply cares about family and friends. Um, and I've taken, I've taken some action to, to try to make an improvement where I can. I, you know, when we're talking about loneliness, loneliness certainly has been around for decades, um, the research goes back decades, and it's worldwide research. Um, and I can tell you that what we have learned is that the United Kingdom and Japan are far ahead of the United States in thinking about this issue. But we're catching up, which is, re which is really great to hear about. So the, yes, the Surgeon General declared loneliness a public health crisis, and that was based upon his evaluation of hundreds of pieces of research across the world on what is happening, not only in the world, but what's happening here in the United States and why are we feeling so disconnected. And he, if, you, if anyone has heard uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy speak, you will hear that he speaks from the heart. He speaks about his own loneliness growing up in his own family, and, and some of the disconnection that he felt, um, and why he, as a, as a physician, has been really thoughtful around social connection with, as he sees patients, because he recognizes that there's a connection, right, between social health and social connectivity and our mental and our physical health. So Senator Chris Murphy, one of Connecticut's senators, certainly has taken the lead federally and trying to get the Senate um, to move forward with some regulation around loneliness and social connection and social media, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about that um, over the next hour. But one of the things that we've done here in the state of Connecticut is a year ago started convening what's called the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. So it's a statewide initiative where we're really focused on improving social connection 
it is all about the dimension of our health and our well-being that comes from connection and comes from community. And social connection really is the foundation of our mental and physical health. And the key is that sense of belonging that we get when we're socially connected with others, or maybe even just one person and having a one-on-one -on -one dialogue and feeling like we belong, like the person hears us and that we, we belong. And that sense of connectivity, that positive connectivity is really what's important. So it's not about volume of connections. Um, it's really about the impact that, that the connection is having on us personally. So social connection is certainly a root cause, or lack of social connection, my apologies, is a root cause of things from anxiety to depression to substance abuse. It's been shown to be a root cause of gun violence and of domestic violence. Um, and so from a mental health perspective, we know that being socially connected and feeling good about our connections day in and day out acts as a protective factor for us against loneliness and against us suffering from some of these mental health issues, starting with anxiety and depression. So basically, you're telling me to not cancel my plans. Don't cancel <laughs> your plans. No. Well, it, it, Be uh, intentional about making those plans. Yes, that's that's something that I'm thinking about as we're as we're sitting here too. And I'm thinking we're making a social connection just by being in this room together. I see nodding of heads, and I think that's a it's a wonderful thing, right? On this Saturday morning. Absolutely. And so we mentioned mental health. So what about the physical health? How are they connected somehow? So. Again, not being a physician, I will do my best. A, a lot of the research that has been done over the past decade on the importance of social connection to our physical health has been focused on older adults. And some of that research shows, for instance, that socially connected people um, really build this protective factor within our bodies that help ward off various physical ailments. And loneliness, which I guess we'll, we'll talk about the, the definition in a moment, but loneliness is a root cause of, for older adults, heart disease. 29% right? higher probability of developing heart disease if you are a lonely older adult. 32% higher probability of having a stroke. And for me, the, the big one is it 50% higher probability of developing some form of dementia. And I think when, we're, when we think about the pandemic, right, and we think about seeing older adults, for instance, in adult living communities, and we weren't, you know, if any of you had an older adult in an adult living community as a family member, you weren't able to get in and see them, right? Maybe you only were able to wave to them through the window or you were able to have a phone call with them, but we know that dementia has spiked as a result of the pandemic. Um, and, and I think we're going to continue to see that being problematic. But the good thing is we can do something about it, and it doesn't cost anything. Right, and I think that will come back to intentionality, right? Uh, especially if we're having this conversation. Right. We're having this conversation together. Perhaps it was not something that you're thinking about. Maybe you'll think about it after this, hopefully. And, uh, but we also want to talk about the stigma of talking about loneliness. I mean, look at us, we're here talking about it on, in a public space and you're here to talk about it as well, but it's actually something that people don't want to talk about. So yes, can you talk about yes, the stigma and yes. what does that look like and how do people talk about it? Yes, thank you for that. Um, let, me, let me first explain what loneliness is. So, you know, whether you are a clinician or a news reporter, um, people tend to use the term isolation and loneliness as though they are the same thing, and they are not. And, and the way that I'd love everyone to think about it is that isolation can be very objectively observed, right? So either someone is isolated and not around other people, or they are around other people and are not isolated. So it's very objective. 
loneliness is a feeling. It's that feeling that we don't have the amount of positive social connection in our lives that provide us with that sense of belonging um, and community and connection. So that's the difference between loneliness and isolation. Loneliness cannot be clinically diagnosed. And it's one of the things that we have been working on with the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness is bringing clinicians together to start to screen for loneliness and what does that look like. Um, and, and it really has to be admitted to. So as far as the stigma, there is a definitely a stigma associated with loneliness. No matter where I go, what we find is that young adults are more apt and more willing to talk about loneliness. I believe it's because they've grown up in this space of being comfortable talking about their mental health. Older adults tend to not want to talk about the stigma uh, or talk about loneliness as much. I would love for everyone to think about it the same way you think about hunger. When you're hungry, it simply means you need food. And when you're lonely, it simply means you need social connection, positive social connection in your life. And, um, you know, we, as uh, each of us, can do something about reducing the stigma simply by talking about it. So I'd like to actually, if we can do this, maybe we can get some audience participation here. Has anyone here ever felt lonely? Raise your hand. Most people, all right. So I, I think if you had looked around when you raised your hands, you would see that most people in the room have felt some loneliness at some point in their life. Um, and it's a human condition, right? So as humans, we are hardwired to be social. We're social beings. And, and when we are lacking that social connectivity that's critical to us, we start to feel lonely. Um, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. It simply means you need to make a change in your life and get some positive social connection. You know, I'm also wondering if this is something that maybe through conversation, maybe yourself or when you're speaking with somebody else, have you ever had a chat where someone's like, you know, I didn't think I needed the social connection, but actually you do. Because so this is an anecdote that I, I share I was, so before I became a reporter with Connecticut Public, I was working on a newspaper, and this was during the lockdown. Um, so that was a really fun time. And uh, I did not bake a single sourdough bread. I did not do a single puzzle. I was, that's how busy I was. I was doing four, five, six stories a day in a very small staff. And, but at the time I was thinking, I wasn't bored because at some point I was getting social connection. I was talking to people almost every day. And then when, when, when we were able to go out a bit more, I, st I went out, talked to people, and all that jazz. But it actually wasn't until, I think it was 2021, that uh, my husband and I did a road trip and met some friends. Uh, and we did a camping trip. And I had a very visceral moment of realization i was sitting on a couch i was with with a friend we're just chatting and i just had a shock go through my body like this is actually what i needed i thought i was having social connection i think i was you know to a certain extent but it wasn't until it was in a non-work environment that my brain kind of exploded and and was like that's actually i didn't realize i needed that social connection and it was a great trip after that when i like connected that that's what i needed so is that common it's, as i'm asking you this very, live it's very common so i th i think what happens is that we believe we're getting the amount of social connection that we need we may feel good about it we we feel comfortable living our lives day in and day out and then something really super positive takes place, right? Connecting with people that you haven't seen in a while or, or connecting with whether it's a family member or a friend where something really clicks and you realize, wow, this is really, really giving me this sense of belonging that I didn't realize I was missing. Um, we hear it all the time. We're listening back to my conversation with Deb Bibbins, who's the founder and CEO of For All Ages and its statewide initiative, the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. We spoke with a live audience at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven. Coming up next, loneliness is impacting everyone. 
but a recent study from Cigna shows that young adults are actually being impacted the most. We continue our conversation after the break. This is Where We Live. I'm Catherine Shen. Stay with us. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're listening back to my conversation with Deb Bivens. She's the founder of For All Ages, an organization uniting older adults and younger generations, and its statewide initiative, the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. This conversation was recorded at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven. We know that loneliness is impacting the older adult population, but young adults are nearly twice as likely to feel lonely. I asked Deb to respond to a study by Cigna Group that says 79% of young adults have reported feeling lonely. When we go out and talk with students, college students or young adults who are not going on to college and going an alternative route, they talk about the fact that they grew up with this built-in social connection, right? So they had their family at home. They grew up with friends, and they graduated high school with the same group of friends that they had known for more than, more than a decade, right? And, and then it all ends, and they're thrust into the world. And if they go to college, they have to find their new world. They have to find their new connection and friends and make friends. Or if they don't go on to college, they then are left with, okay, many of my friends going on to college and and I'm not going that route. And so how do I get my social connectivity? Um, It's a, a great example of a transition period in our lives that causes loneliness. Um, and and it's, it's also tied to social media, which I think we'll talk about in a, in a minute. But one of the things that we know is that transition periods in our lives are the times when we can feel the loneliest. And I think it makes sense when you think about it, right? So whether you are going off to college for the first time, and you're, like I said, you're thrust into this new world where you know no one and you're expected to make friends and, and you know, figure out wh- who do you have a common connection and common interest with, or whether you're starting a new job, moving to a new city, moving to a new state, um, new moms. New moms are significantly suffering from loneliness. And, you know, we know a little bit about that um, people have been talking about, in general, new moms, um, you know, they're, they're suffering because, well, first of all, just the stress and the exhaustion of having this new little human that you have to care for. But also, if, if the mom was working, presumably was working, now she's home alone, um, and she's lost that social connection that she got used to going into work every day and being around her work colleagues um, and, and so that's significant. Um, I can tell you caregivers are also now being talked about, which, which I feel great about, um, because so many of us are caregivers for older adults. When you become a caregiver, you sort of put your own health aside, and you're focused on caring for a loved one. And um, caregivers are some of the loneliest people, and we, we as, a, as community members need to do more to care for our caregivers. Um, Retirement. Retirement is another time where people, you know, they get so excited about retiring. And again, they, you know, they leave behind the colleagues that they got to know um, and their home. And the first six months is fantastic. And then after the after those six months, people start saying, okay, what what is my purpose? Right? And and what what am I to do from here? And I've actually told my husband he's not allowed to retire until he figures out his next his next role. Like, what is he going to do? What is it going to be? It does. I don't care what it is, but it needs to be something where he can have a purpose and where he can get some social connection. You know, we talked about the older generation as well. Seventy plus is the second population that experiences uh, loneliness the worst under our, our yes. younger people. So, can you talk about that a little bit? You know, why sure. do you think that is? Sure. Well, you know, I think I think we can all probably think about the fact that as we grow older, some of our friends and family members start to pass away, and um, that seventy plus population. Um, you know, if we're so lucky to be 70, 80, 90 years old, we're going to lose a lot of our friends 
who weren't so lucky, right? Who who passed away due to you know whatever health health reasons there were, and so we're not only losing our our family and our our you know core support network of of cousins and parents and all of that, but we start to lose our friends also. Um, you know, this is what happened to the family member that I spoke to um, spoke about early on. Is um, you know he was he was very socially connected to a group of fishing buddies, um, and one by one they started to pass away. And he was the last sort of that you know he used to say I'm the last one standing, and now I'm fishing alone. Um, and so that happens. Um, and that can happen. It's one of the one of the reasons to foster intergenerational connections, especially as we get older, um, to foster those connections with people that are younger than us. I know it sounds sort of morbid, but um, statistically, they're more likely to you know still be around as you age um, and can provide that helpful um, social connection. We love intergenerational friendships. Uh, one of our, one of our, one of my family friends, uh, sh she's around, I want to say, thirty-five, and one of her best, one of her besties, as she calls her, is uh, eighty-five, and uh, the eighty-five-year-old aunt is what we call her too. Always jokes about how like learning young lingo helps her a lot. She's always learning the next thing, and so it really helps her brand. I mean, she's 85 and sprightly. Like, you would not be able to to tell that she's 85, and she she actually says those fantastic. I know, right? It's goals, um, but it's those conversations that she's like, it's better than doing a crossword. Like, it's better than doing a puzzle, because she's actively connecting with this person, and because the person literally has a different language, so she has to keep up. And then the younger person also learns patience and and teaching her aunt uh the language that that she's using and it's just this beautiful friendship i think i think you get more out of it than you think at first you thought oh just friends and and you're just hanging out but you're actually getting more intergenerational connection is we call it sort of the icing on the cake so um so not only are you getting the social connection right that provides all of the value of, of that's providing that sense of belonging and connectivity to help our health, our mental and physical health. But we're getting, as older adults, we're able to mentor someone and have a sense of purpose and share our wisdom and share our experience. And, you know, for the young adults or for a child, right, is whatever age group we're talking about, that younger person, they're getting a mentor. And they're able to talk with someone who isn't their mom or their dad, um, which can be really positive, for sure. You know, intergenerational connection is one of those magical things that helps us understand each other better. And, and exactly what you were saying, right? So, you, you know, you get to learn a little bit. As an older adult, you get to learn a little bit about what it's like to be a young adult growing up right in 2024 what did, what does it look and feel like um, because it's certainly different from from when an older adult was growing up and and vice versa um, for all ages has an intergenerational program there's actually a rack card outside um, and it connects a college student with an older adult age 55 plus during the college semester for a weekly phone call um, and it's simple right and and we Pair two people based on common interests that they share in their application. We facilitate their growth of a friendship via weekly phone calls. And um, we provide conversation starters every week so people have something to talk about. And what we hear at the end is not only from the older adults about how positive, what a positive influence this has been on their life, but from the young adults who say, gosh, I was having a tough time this semester and I couldn't talk to my parents but I had someone to talk to. Um, it, it's just been tremendous as far as um, tackling ageism, not only from that perspective, but just that magic of that connection taking place. We had a, a, a set of friendship, I, I guess I can call it that, on, on the show uh, when, when you did our Where We Live show last fall. And one of the things that I remember is, is so actually I, I believe the, the older, uh, she's an an aunt that's like 85 years old, actually. It's not the same person, I swear. Um, and I remember she she mentioned that that was something that she was looking forward to. 
Because I believe she she yes. was someone who was living in in a in a senior living facility, and it was the phone call was something she looked forward to every week with the college student. Yes, and the college student shared that she loved us because of the wisdom that she was getting. And yes. actually, as we're talking, I was just thinking um, an experience I had. When I was in my early 20s, I was just starting off my career as a newspaper reporter in Santa Barbara, California, and I was on this art tour. So you can go to this artist's house and like check out their place, which was really cool. Um, but I will never forget a conversation I had with somebody who was in their 70s. And he shared that he vo he's always wanted to be an artist, but couldn't make a living out of being an artist. So he did a day job for, say, 40 years, and now he can do whatever he wants because he's retired. And I was about 23, 24 at the time, and it struck me hard. I still remember it to this day, obviously, but it gave me a sense of hope that, oh, yeah, you don't have to do the thing by the time you're 30 or 40 or 50. But that was what I got from this older person, and I needed someone outside of my parents' face to tell me that, right? And But That's I was wonderful. able to get that because of my work. So yeah, it was just yeah. a beautiful moment for me. Yeah, you know, I think uh, as, as we're living longer and we're thinking about not only, you know, our, our, our second chapter, but our third chapter and our fourth chapter, it gives us the ability, I feel, to have more freedom and more flexibility. Um, so I'm, I'm getting up to the point where I guess, I mean, for all ages, considers older adults age 55 plus. I'm 59, so I guess I'm in that older adult population now. But... I, I feel like I have so much to learn from some of the people that I have met via For All Ages that are in their 80s and 90s, right? That's a, that's a different generation than my generation. And there's still so much wisdom. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite volunteers um, that I've been fortunate enough to meet and get to know via For All Ages is a 92-year-old retired physician who takes classes every semester at Central Connecticut State University. Um, and he does pottery classes, he does metalworking classes. He actually has a show coming up at CCSU in the fall where he's got this huge space and all of his artwork is going to be shown. And he is the, one of the most vibrant individuals that, that I have ever met. And he, t he will say, it's the social connection that I get by going to class, connecting with the younger students, um, and just being able to have this purpose that keeps me going and keeps, you know, keeps me aging well. What about demographics? Because we also know from studies that men deal with loneliness very differently from women, yes. and, and the impacts are also very different. Can you touch on that a little yes. bit? Yes. So the research shows that men tend to be lonelier than women, um, certainly that's a generalization, but I, the, what the research shows is that men tend to not be intentional about having social connection and, and fostering social connection in their lives. Um, men tend to be, you know, sort of the, the solo guys that are just doing their thing and, and don't really, in some cases, I've had men say, I don't know how to make friends. Like, no one has ever taught me how to do this. Like, what do I do? How do I go out and where do I start? And, and what I say is start where your passion lies, right? So pick that area, whatever your passion is, whether you love to play the guitar or you really enjoy, um, you know, rock music or, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, photography. Photography is a big one where people... Because people of all ages can participate in it, um, people tend to pick up photography really at any age of their lives. And um, when you join a photography club, it's, it's one of the most inclusive clubs that you can find because everyone's helping each other, um, which never I didn't realize before I started this job um, you know, of, of fostering social connection here. It, it, that photographers are, are just great at social connection. There's a lot of men that are photographers and that, that find their sense of connection and community via a local photography club. So with that in mind, too, because approaching people, it, it can't be scary, and you don't know what you're going to get from the other person. Right. They might think right. you're just this creeper coming up, right? I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> I promise I'm not. I'm just really interested in you. Um, but how, so how do, you, how do we actually do that and help each other improve that social connection when 
Mm-hmm. Maybe you have a friend that you know has a hard time approaching new people or you yourself. Maybe you're like, I don't know if I have any interest. So I don't know if I want to go to a photography club or or a chess club yes. or, or whatnot. So what do you do yes. in that space? So, the, you know, and, and we get that question a, a lot, actually. Uh, you know, where do we, where do I start sort of sort of question? And, and I think the answer is reaching out to a friend to go somewhere with you, right? And, and, and actually having a phone call, right? So actually picking up the telephone and, and asking a person to attend an event with you. Um, you know, we know that loneliness, it doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, loneliness is, you know, universal. As, and, and it's not that introverts are lonelier. That's not the case at all. It's not what the research shows. It really is about having the comfort in, in being able to step into a new space. And w- what we know is that when you can step into a new space with a friend, um, you're automatically, you've got that buddy and you're more, you're more likely to do it. Um, and so we, we always say, you know, reach out to someone reach out to a friend, you know, if you want to go attend like t- an event like today, um, perhaps you had a friend reach out to you and say, well, you come with me, right? Did anyone, did anyone here have a friend reach out to them, right? So there's some people here that said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, will you, will you come with me to this event? That's good. You did a good job, right? Like that's what we want. We want each other to be helping one another. Um, one of the things that, this is one of my little props here. So the more we get together, the happier we'll be. Um, it, you know, is one, you guys are laughing, right? Some people recognize it. I'm not going to try to sing it because um, I can't sing. But some of you may recognize it. This was actually a poem that was written by a poet in the United Kingdom more than 100 years ago. He was asked to craft a little jingle for a children's charity to try to get people to, you know, to, to foster donations. And he came up with this poem, The More We Get Together, The Happier We'll Be, and it goes on, you know, you guys probably know it. Um, and it was all about, the children's charity was all about fostering social connection for children more than 100 years ago. And so people have been talking about social connection on and off, you know, a little bit for more than, for you know, more than a century. And if you remember nothing else from today's talk, remember this, because this is really what life is all about. Um, and, and that's really what we're talking about today is that positive social connection and helping each other foster it. We're listening back to my conversation with Deb Bibbins, who's the founder and CEO of For All Ages and the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. We spoke at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven. Coming up next, is social media keeping us connected or making us even lonelier? This is Where We Live. I'm Catherine Shen. Stay with us. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We can't talk about loneliness without talking about social media and mental health. Social media might be a way we stay in touch, but research is showing that it also exacerbates mental illness, especially for young people. Adolescents who spend three hours or more on social media double their risk for anxiety and depression. Earlier this month, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy announced he's pushing to add tobacco-style warning labels on social media platforms. Today, we're listening back to my panel discussion with Deb Bibbins. She's a founder of For All Ages, an organization uniting older adults and younger generations, and its statewide initiative, the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. We spoke at the International Festival of Arts in New Haven. Let's get back to our conversation. The internet didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, And by the time I was in high school, dating myself here, but I had to wait for an entire evening on 56K internet to download a movie trailer and watch the next morning to get me going and want to go to school. Um, And so that didn't exist for me as as a kid. But now... Nor did it exist for me. Right. And so, but but I I have very positive experiences with social media as an adult. Uh, Facebook happened when I went to college. It was still when it was EDU. So you had to have an EDU email address to have Facebook. 
And I connected with, uh, fell, I'm from California. I went to school in Washington State. I was the only student that was an out-of-state student in my core. And so I guess that, that's the kind of loneliness I was experiencing without realizing. And I was able to find community from, from social media. And, and then as an adult, I'm, a, I'm also able to find community through different spaces. And it's also all ages. But I also know that's a very specific experience. I, right, I, I right. came with it with a lot of intention. Um, but it can also be used in all kinds of ways. So can yes. you talk about that? Right? Yes. Like, it really depends on the user, it seems like. It, it, it does. And so I, I guess where I would start is, is certainly social media has some positives to it. Right? It gives us the ability to connect with people that may not be physically located near us. It, it gives us the ability to connect with people that have common interests. But I, I think just like anything else, when taken to the extreme, that's when there starts to have some detrimental impacts. And you know, especially for our youth and our children that have grown up with, with phones and social media, um, there haven't been enough guardrails around how much time people are spending on social media. You know, the, the business of social media, and I don't want to get too political here, but the business of social media is all about keeping people connected and scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, and it takes us away from the social connections that we need in our lives. Um, Certainly, Vivek Murthy, our U.S. Surgeon General, started asking Congress to think about putting warning labels, mandating warning labels on, on social media. And it's because it's going to help parents who are raising their hands saying, I need some help monitoring this. And it's, it's, I, you know, I feel this peer pressure to let my children continue to be on social media 24 seven because all of their friends get to do it. And so for a number of reasons, I think he's putting that forth. And, and I know that Congress has been talking about that. But it's, it's just when we take it to the extreme, right? So we know that, that teens that spend it three hours or more a day on social media have a doubling of the probability of suffering from anxiety and depression, right? So I think everyone needs to understand that it's the it's a highlight reel of our lives, right? What we see is not a, all it's not authentic to who that per, whole person is. It's just a highlight reel. But for youth and for teens that haven't matured to understand that, they see it and then they they think, well, gee, I'm not good enough. I don't measure up to that. And then that starts them feeling, well, I'm, I'm feeling a little disconnected and I'm feeling lonely. And it's this downward spiral that can really start to happen. Um, there is a middle school in Manchester, Connecticut. I saw this on the news. I don't know if anyone else did a couple of months ago where they implemented these little pouches for kids that came into the middle school at the beginning of the day. They would put their phones in a pouch. The pouch was locked. They could not unlock it until the end of the day. There was a little magnet on the wall and it, 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 it unlocks their phone. And when the news reporter went out to interview, um, what ended up happening is that the kids said, thank you for doing this. Like, we love this because now I get to talk to my friends, right? And so kids are, they're, they really are pining for reasons to put their phone away and, and as our parents doing that too. So it's, and you know, it's something that I think we all ought to be thinking about spending less time on our phones. Well, I can imagine if you grew up with a phone in your hand, it's hard to remember that you can leave it, right? I mean, even I forget sometimes, like, it's okay to leave your phone behind. It's not going to causing. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I have an example for last night, last night, you know, the storms that came through knocked out our power. Um, I, I live up in Greater Hartford, and um, a lightning strike knocked out the power. And four hours into it, you know, my husband was looking at Eversource on his phone, as though he was going to will the power to come back. And I said, put your phone down, and let's go out into the backyard. And we went out into the backyard, and everything was dark because no one in the neighborhood had power. And the, at the lightning bugs, like the fireflies, were just magical. Yeah. And we spent 25 minutes just sitting out there, just talking, and just enjoying the fireflies. And I, we would have never done that, right, if the TV were on and, you know, if, if we had been focused on our phones. Well, one of my favorite first world problems is when the power goes out and you're forced to not be on your phone because you want to conserve. And I would read by candlelight. It's so romantic, right? 
but then you realize there's a reason why everyone's eyesight was really bad way back when. So that's, <laughs> that's right. That was my discovery. So we took out the camping lamp in, instead. <laughs> um, so I want to leave some room for questions, but just lastly, because we mentioned the pandemic, and I, I do want to touch on how you know this is loneliness is an issue that that was already in conversation before the pandemic before the lockdown happened but certainly because of what's been going on it has been exacerbated mm -hmm. and so what are certainly. your thoughts about that and also in terms of looking ahead yes you know, what can we do to yes. i mean mend the exacerbation maybe or even just start that social connection as we've been talking have we been talking about this morning yes uh, you know we we've been talking to a lot of librarians who have said we're, we're offering more programs than we ever have and we're we're struggling with having our community members come in and engage with them and we talk to people who say i i, I think i've forgotten how to reach out to people and how to connect because i got so comfortable right just being at home and i i, I think well we know that the pandemic caused loneliness to creep up to around 85%, right? So it, it's back down to only an epidemic level at around 61%. But it went up to 85% during the pandemic, but many people are still stuck in this space where they haven't really reached out to people. Um, you know, I guess one of the things that I would say is, think about someone that you haven't reached out to in six months or a year or two years or three years and call them today. When you leave here, just, just make a phone call. Reach out to someone. And, and don't start it with an apology of, I'm sorry I haven't talked to you in three years. Start it with, I was thinking about you today. And I wanted to call you to, see, to check in and see how you're doing. Because it makes it such a world of difference. You're listening to my conversation with Deb Bibbins, who's the founder and CEO of For All Ages and the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven. We have some time to take audience questions. Our first question was about young adults on young men and masculinity. So I've worked with like teenagers a good amount, and so I really appreciated the discussion around like demographics of loneliness, especially around like young men and masculinity. Um, and so just thinking about that, that's something I've always been really interested in and think about as like in a mentor role. And so I was just wondering if you had any more that could uh, share about like what it is potentially that you think about like masculinity and manhood that like leads to this like kind of uh, disparagement in like uh, social connections and what as like parents or mentors we can do to help support young men in like being able to have fulfilling relationships. We need to just ensure that our young adults uh, and our teens are comfortable reaching out to others and, and starting a dialogue. Um, and, and, and be comfortable using telephones. You know, one of the things that I think we don't do a, a good enough job as parents, and, and I'm just as guilty, is, is teaching our youth to be comfortable making a phone call. Um, it's one of the things that we find with our T three intergenerational friendship community is that we've had we've had some young adults, especially some freshmen in college, say to us, "This was the first time I ever made a phone call on the telephone." I have received calls from my parents and from others, but I've never really gotten comfortable making a phone call, and it took some time for me to get comfortable and 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 knowing what to say even on the telephone. So I think that's a space where w we can do better and, and we, can, we can help one another with that, especially our, you know, our, the, the teens and adolescents. I, I also think that I feel like today is better than it was 50 years ago where, where people are talking about mental health, right? And it's more open and, and we're being more willing to share when we're having a, a problem. Um, and so I would just do everything I could to foster that. Foster the willingness to have authentic conversations and, and be comfortable sharing who you, know, who you are and, and admitting, right, I feel lonely or I, I don't know how to do X, Y, Z. Whatever it is, just having the comfort of being able to share I think goes a long way. Uh, early on you, you mentioned that 
the incidence of loneliness is, is different in, in Europe and in Japan, and they're doing better in dealing well, with it. And any specifics about programs and how much is governmental versus nonprofits? Yes, yes. So the so let me just clarify the the statistics around loneliness in the United States and throughout the world are consistent. Um, but the United Kingdom and Japan started thinking about this years ago. UK, for a decade ago, um, they developed the Minister of Loneliness, um, and it's a governmental position, and it's over all of the United Kingdom. And the, so there is a governmental department that has been f fost fostering social connection for people of all ages. And what they've asked community members to do is to think about what can, what can they do for their own community? What can they do for their neighborhood and their community? What can they start? There's been men's walking clubs that have started. There have been grocery stores that have instituted a slow line. And that's for people that just want to talk, right? And so I'm, I'm serious. This is, this is happening. Um, and so, you know, and there's a long line. And everyone in that line knows that they're just going to be patient because they're going to get their turn and having that social connection. So there are those types of things that have been going on now for, for a good decade over in the United Kingdom. Japan also similarly started something about five or six years ago, um, and they've been fostering it. I, I, change happens locally. We know that, right? So change happens within our own community, within our neighborhood. Um, and, and I think what Japan and UK have, have done a really good job of is educating all of the residents to say, okay, I can foster this change for myself, for my friends, for my community, and getting people engaged and thinking about it. Our last question came from a young person who shared their own mental health journey and asked how mental illness and loneliness are intertwined. What we know is that anxiety and depression can cause us to not connect socially and to become lonely. And that loneliness then will exacerbate anxiety and depression and other mental illness. And so, you know, similar to my answer previously, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there and step outside and, and say, okay, I'm going to take one step forward to connect with one person today that's going to, to then hopefully foster a positive social connection for yourself. Um, you know, people that are suffering from anxiety and depression, as you mentioned, may be less likely to want to connect with others, but you've got to try. You've got to try because I think what you're going to find when you reach out and connect with someone else is that you're, you're going to have a welcoming ear. Um, even if it's just going out and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, attending an event like this or, you know, going to, uh, you know, a, a, for a hobby or even just going for a walk, right? So, you know, we talk about social connection not costing anything and it really doesn't. But if you pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, what do you think about going for a walk today? Right? Um, you might be surprised that you get the answer that, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Or maybe not today because I already have plans, but let's do it tomorrow kind of thing. Um, I, I think what we've heard from so many people as we've been out talking to people is that once someone takes the, a step, they are surprised at how easy it is to then take further steps. That was Deb Bibbins. She's the founder and CEO of For All Ages and the Connecticut Collaborative to End Loneliness. We'll link to the conversations on loneliness, including with U.S. Senator Chris Murphy on our webpage. And we'll also have a link to learn more about the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven. Shout out and thanks to Knight Connor and Tiffany Hopkins at the International Arts and Ideas Festival to make this happen together. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening.